How are we doing today? Pretty good. Are we sensing that there's some momentum going on? There's something happening here because summer's kind of coming to a close and school's getting ready to get started. We have, do we have some teachers here? The teachers already like opened the doors of the school last week, right? Started getting up early again, preparing for school. And did anybody get to meet their, their teachers? Maybe and find out some people that are in their class? Maybe a little bit. There's a little bit of kind of excited, but then a little bit nervous about school starting, right? I remember I enjoyed that because I loved going to going to school back to school shopping for the supplies to get like the composition books, pick the right colors. And if if we're really nice parents, you might buy your kids some back to school clothes or some new shoes. I remember just how fun it was to get shoes, especially because new shoes smell good. And I remember just putting them right, setting out the clothes that you're going to wear the day before school started. It was it's kind of like parents' ways of. Okay, let's make it a little bit more exciting to go to school so you have some good things to look forward to. Super. And then I think while we sense that momentum happening around us, there's also momentum happening in church here and in, in our world. And we actually had, we've got, we, we've got our groups that are going to be starting in a couple of weeks, life groups, which will be fun. Everybody excited about that? Maybe so. And we're going to be doing a church-wide curriculum, which will be fun. And two weeks ago, we've had some really good communicators this summer, haven't we? Amanda was up here a couple of weeks ago, and she was challenging our heart. And she said, hey, do you have a divided heart? You're kind of like in a couple of different camps, or are you singly focused on following God and kind of living out a life that looks like that? Um, And then we had Julia up here last week, and she talked to us. She encouraged us. She said, hey, we all need people that are that we can pour into as well as people that will pour into us. She talked, said that big word, discipling. And, and she called us out on our excuses, like, oh, I don't know if I can do that. For the, and, and, she, and we listened, and if you were like me, you said, you know what, that's good. I, I need that. I need somebody pouring into me, and I need somebody that I can pour into. But I also sit there and go, hmm, but I'm not sure how to get from where I'm sitting right now to there. Can anybody relate? That sounds, Julia, that sounds like the deep end. And I'm over here in my diaper with my rubber pants going, where's the baby pool? Where's the baby pool? And so my hope today is, is that God's been taking me on a journey over the last several years, helping me to see maybe some small little steps to take me from here to discipling. Maybe a little bit like breadcrumbs along the road so that we could figure it out. Does that make sense? And are you willing to go on that journey while I share a little bit about that? Let's pray. Father, thank you for uh, the privilege that it is uh, to be here with my people. Uh, Give us greater desire for you. Help us to hear what you want us to hear today, me included. And show us how to join you in what you're doing. We praise you for your presence today. Amen. Okay, so I'm Julie Gubert, the Connections Director here at Bridgepoint. And back in 2017, I heard a message from John Maxwell. And that we had gone to a GROW conference in Birmingham, all all of us on the staff here. And have you heard of John Maxwell before? He's a big leadership guru, um, written lots and lots of books, is just an incredible speaker. And he was a pastor as well, off and on over the years in his life. And he talked that day about valuing people and loving people. And actually, he shared about a time when God said, you know what, you've been a pastor at a church, and you know all these people that are believers. I want you to go out into the world and spend time with people that would never darken the doors of a church. And, and so he started doing that. And he, he does so much in the business world. He's just one of the biggest, most incredible speakers and leaders. And so he's talked about valuing people. And he said, everybody has something to offer. We're all God's children, and there's value in every person. So call it out. Call, pursue that and call it out in people. And he said, if there's one prayer that God will answer... It's this prayer. 
God, make me a soul winner. Make me somebody who would attract people to him. And I thought, okay. I, I recognize, I, can, I value my people, like my family and my little chosen people, but I don't value people like you're talking about. I don't care that much about just anybody out there. And I said, okay, God, uh, will you make me a soul winner? I, I don't know what that's going to look like, but would you make me a soul winner? And so this is the journey of just where he's taken me. And that was a big tipping point for me, listening to that message. And I try to go back and listen to it every year to just remind myself of what God's doing. So I want to introduce this little phrase here that's pretty simple and easy. Gather and go while we grow. Gather and go while we grow. And if I think about th what is gather, I mean, gathers, the definition says, bring together, collect, scoop up, or take up from a resting place. So, I mean, like, you could gather the shoes. Does everybody have shoes that get scattered all over the house? And some, just pick up your shoes. Can you get a, can you get a two- or a three-year-old to pick up shoes in the house? Yes, yes. Gathering is something that's pretty simple. It is. So I'm wondering if gathering is the discipling at its earliest stages. And, and maybe that's something we can wrap our minds around to get us to develop our soul-winning hearts. So let's first look at our first verse, which is Paul talking, 1 Corinthians 9. And it says, Even though I am free of the demands and expectations of everyone, that means he kind of must have gotten free of people-pleasing, right? That's a, big, that's a big challenge for us, huh? I have voluntarily become a servant to any and all in order to reach, that's the gather part, a wide range of people. And then he starts listing off the options. Religious, non-religious, meticulous moralist, loose living immoralist, the defeated, the demoralized, whoever. And I thought, when I listened to that part of the verse, I realized, how do we ever know where anybody is spiritually? How, how do we know if somebody's come far from God or has been walking with God for a long time? We don't know. And I love how this verse just says, hey, let's gather everybody. I, I need soul winning. I need other people to encourage me, and so do you. The rest of the verse says, I didn't, didn't take on their way of life, I kept my bearings in Christ. That's the grow part. That's the part being solid in Christ. But I entered their world. That's the go part. And tried to experience things from their point of view. I've become just about every sort of servant there is in my attempt to lead those I meet into a God-saved life. And I did this because of the message. I didn't just want to talk about it. I wanted to be in on it. Is this inspiring? I just love this verse for so many, these collection of verses for so many reasons. But that's, that, you can see the gather and go while we grow right in that. Let's look and see what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 12, verse 30. This is a tough verse. Whoever is not with me is against me. And whoever does not gather with me scatters. I, I'm already uncomfortable with the verse because it doesn't look like there's a middle ground. I'm either gathering or I'm scattering. So that's convicting and makes me think, okay, what does scatter mean? You know, I got to look up definitions. To cause to separate widely, to fling away heedlessly, distribute irregularly, divide into ineffectual, small portions, maybe leave behind. <laughs> this past week, I was on a, a call, I was on the phone with an insurance person. Does anybody relate? That's really a fun thing to do, isn't it? <laughs> on hold. Can, you, who you, can I put you on hold again? Can I, can I put you on hold again? And I'm sitting there getting more and more irritated while I'm on that call. And and I know she could tell, because we all have that irritated voice that 
Even somebody, your husband walking by, ooh, I know that's not good. Whatever's happening there. I was in that irritated place and being kind of short with her. And I felt God going, are you gathering right now or are you scattering? Like cast away heedlessly, like not care about the person who's on the other line. And I switched into the gather mode, which probably made her go, what happened to you just now? (laughs) But I started to be kind and patient, started thinking, what would it be like to be doing her work? Am I contributing to her feeling like she doesn't do a very good job and she's not making anything happen? Or am I contributing to her feeling valued? And am I thinking about what it would be like to be in her world? Uh, I, I often find, and maybe you can relate to this, that I need to be in the right mood to gather. Can anybody relate to that? Sometimes that's tough. And so when I'm thinking about gathering, I also think, okay, Jesus gathered. He, he, he gathered us, all of us that are with him now. He, he continue, continually pursues. He pursues the lost sheep. You know, he's the shepherd. So I started going down that path thinking about him as the shepherd and the sheep. And this caused me to have to go read about dogs that herd sheep. Now, how many of you know that I'm not a dog person? I am not a dog person at all. So I know that the um, whatever the things happen, you know how when Google sees you looking up something, they start sending you a bunch of stuff. So maybe now they're going to send me a bunch of stuff about dogs going, hey, what's happened there? She's now interested in dogs. But I started reading about dogs that herd sheep. And listen to what, listen to what this says. A well-trained herding dog will not cause additional stress for the livestock and is an extension of the human handler. In our minds, in our hearts, our human handler is our God. The trained herding dog responds to a series of verbal commands issued by the human handler. So constantly listening for God of what to do, what do you want me to do next? Now listen to this part. However, the pairing of high energy and high intelligence means that herding dogs are not content to laze around the house or the farm. Unemployed herding dogs can become destructive. Chasing livestock, chasing people, do I chase people sometimes? Or engaging in unwanted behavior. So if God's called us to gather with him, if I'm not gathering, I'm scattering I might be engaging in unwanted behavior and chasing things that aren't fruitful, could be destructive. So I I actually pull this video and I want to show this, but I want to tell you some things to look for in the video. This is a video of a dog named Stormy. I had to watch it three or four times to figure out that it was a female dog. And she listens, she listens so well to her handler. She Watch how far out, I mean, you can barely see her. She goes so far out around all the sheep to gather every one. And she's really excited to obey her handler. And then at the very end, she hops up and you can hear that good and faithful servant kind of word that her handler gives her. And it's really cute. So now watch this and think about yourself. You might see yourself as one of the sheep, which is kind of fun. But watch and see, could we be a little bit more like a herding dog bringing people into the family? Okay, let's see the video. Come on. Sometimes I stand there like, duh, what do you want me to do? (laughs) Come by. Walk on, good girl. Walk on. (laughs) 
here's the good part. Dolly! Oh. Good girl, Stormy. There. Okay, now, so doesn't, is, isn't this a dog thing where a dog wags its tail a lot when it's happy? So, so that's what the dog was doing at the end, just so excited to be pleasing to her master, which is very cool. So all this makes me think, what's the difference? What does a person who gather look like versus a person who scatters? A person who gathers is open, open to others, open to other people. Whereas a person who scatters says, no, I, I, I got my people. I don't, I don't do stuff with those. I don't people do anything with people that look like that or that aren't exactly like me. I think about maybe a person who gathers would do anything for anybody in the moment. A person who gathers smiles and look at, looks at you in the eyes. Uh, and God's work with me on this. Boy, d does anybody have that intense leave me alone face? There's another word for it, but it's not very nice. And so, <laughs> but it, where, and, and we know it. I mean, I, I can do that when I'm in the middle of doing a lot of stuff. I get this scrunched up shoulder in my face like, don't, be, don't get in my way. If you know that you have that face, ask God to help you with it. To start to intentionally, before you get out of the car, say, I'm, I'm going to put on a smile. I'm going to look somebody in the eye. And I'm going to ask him something about them to express value to them. God can change this. He, he's been working with me on these kinds of things over the years. A person who scatters has a lot of boundaries. And I know there are healthy boundaries. There are. But little margin. I don't have time for that. I don't have time to say hello. I don't have time to get in a big conversation. That's the difference between gathering and scattering. And this, there's a girl, there's a girl at the gym. She's a teacher, and I've always admired her because for years, she comes into her class at least 15 or 20 minutes early. She handles all the logistical things that she needs to run the class well, and then she walks around and talks to people. She learns everybody's name in the in the room. If they're new, she comes over and says, "Hey." Welcome, my name is Kristen, and I, I teach the class, and how can I help you? She asks, oh, Julie, I missed you last week. And, I, and I'll say where I was, and then, or I'll tell her I'm going to travel somewhere, and she'll say, how was your trip? She, every time I go to her class, I feel valued by her, and that, that I was worth knowing. That's what a person who does that gathers. Giving up our kind of self-preservation, our agenda, our, all that stuff is the beginnings of soul winning being developed in us. It begins to develop that soul winning. Let's look at Matthew chapter 5, verse 7. This is in where Jesus was talking about the Beatitudes, and it says, you are blessed when you care. At the moment of being careful, full of care, you find yourself cared for. How, how many of you have experienced that? When you care for somebody else, somehow it just boomerangs back to you in some way. And I think a person who gathers is described as somebody who's full of care for others. So what does gathering look like in the church family? Like among us, like how do we gather each other? Well, it's certainly speaking to people. Maybe getting their phone number and putting them in your phone instead of just having your phone be for your favorites so that you could reach out and send a note or invite them to do something. How many of us in here wish that somebody even in our church family would invite them to do something? Come sit with me during my daughter's practice. Let's go for a walk together and get some exercise. Want to meet for coffee? I, didn't be, I wasn't a person that ever liked to go out to lunch or coffee, ever. And I felt like God was going, you need to start being willing to do that because people enjoy that. Gather. Sometimes in the church family, it's reaching out. You reaching out and saying, this is a heavy, hard thing for me. 
I, I need some help. I'm discouraged. I need prayer. Because you are strengthening me when you push me in that spot of going, how will I help this person? God, can you show me how to help her or him? So it's reaching out. It's sharing your burden. It's asking me, what can, how can I pray for you? Or how, want to do something? Let's just hang out. And then what does gathering look like outside of the church? Like with just everywhere we go. Because remember our verse said, we entered their world to experience things from their point of view. To so hopefully help people be led into a God-saved kind of life. Well, God really worked this out in me. Two weeks ago, Rick and I went to a sailing event at Lake Alatuna. Now, uh, this sailing event, and I have a slide here for this thing that's going on. Rick's brother, Steve, was running this event. And he's a big sailor. And it, it says Marshmallow Intergalactic Competition or Championship, right? I don't know what the intergalactic part is. It's something Star Wars. I don't do Star Wars, so I don't know any of that. They did have some Star Wars music going, but, but I, don't, I don't do that. But anyways, this event was put on at the Atlanta Yacht Club for the purpose of attracting people that might want to explore what sailing could be like. And so they said, there's hot dogs and marshmallows. The marshmallows are the people that don't know what they're doing, have never sailed before, or are very inexperienced sailors. The hot dogs are the experienced sailors. So they said, here's what we're going to do. It's a little boat that has two people in it. We're going to put a hot dog with a marshmallow. And so, so we're going there, and I, I'm like, okay, uh, uh, can we take our motorboat? Because I, I, that's my comfortable place. I like to go and lay on a raft in the lake. I don't, I'm not all interested in doing a lot of work on a sailboat. Okay, and, and I do not want to have a sailboat tip upside down and have to turn a boat up, right side up and then climb all up on the boat. Okay, I'm not interested in that either or losing my sunglasses or those things. Okay, anyway, all, all the... Un okay, what was that verse about going into a place where you don't... some place that you're not used to? This was me going into there, right? And we said, no, we're, we're going to drive over so you won't be able to escape on the motorboat. So we go over, and Steve, I mean, I saw him in his element. He's standing on the picnic bench, on the picnic table. Hey, everybody, marshmallows and hot dogs. This is a great day. The wind is just right for sailing today. And, and he had arranged food, and he had prizes, and he was just so reassuring. Okay, so I'm sitting there going, I don't know anybody here except for Rick and then Steve. Okay, this is going to be all right. What if I have to go to the bathroom on the sailboat? No, we're not going to think about that. So then, and, and then I realized, okay, I feel like God's going, you know what? Stop overthinking. Just bring me with you. And you know what we did? Rick started grilling the burgers and the hot dogs because that's what he does. And the grill master, I don't know where he was, or if he's late or whatever. And then I, for some reason, just started thinking, okay, I'm going to pretend like I'm in the lobby at church, and I can just talk to people like I would do. And they even had name tags there, and you guys know I like name tags. So, so I just started talking to the people around me and met people, and, and we ended up having a good time. And we actually won third place in one of the races, which I'm competitive, so I feel like God was giving me that as kind of like a little reward for being willing to go somewhere where it's uncomfortable. But what's fun is the next day, one of the women that I met sent me a text and said, thanks so much. It was so great to meet you. Thanks so much for making us feel so welcome. And I was going, this isn't even my place. This is, I don't even, I wasn't even, I'm not a part of this generally. But let me ask you this. Do you think that Steve felt valued and worth knowing and worth being interested, us being interested in what he was doing, what he likes to do. Yeah. And we had fun. It wasn't as bad as we thought it would be, or at least as I thought it. Rick's always willing to do something like that. But listen, Jesus came to the earth to be a marshmallow for us. I mean, he was in his comfortable place up in heaven, but he decided... I love you. I love you so much. I care for you so much 
that I'm going to come down to earth and experience life from your point of view. He did that for us. And that's how he asks us to do the same, to, to gather and love people. So what are we gathering people to? I mean, that's the go part. Where are we going? And I think we all realize pretty quickly that in our flesh, when we start interacting with other people, we have about this much to offer in our flesh apart from God. And I think that's part of his design is once, like, if somebody tells me, oh, I, this is an awful experience that I'm going through, Julie. I, I, my, I'm going through a divorce. And I sit there and go, ah, I don't know how to help. I don't know what to do. What do I say? That drives me to the Father so that I can say, God, show me what to do. Help me not to say something stupid. Help me to be encouraging. That drives us to our God. So we have to decide God's going to be my guide. Following him is kind of like moving on a moving sidewalk. It's sort of a big first step to go, am I going to do this? Am I going to do this? But then once you get on, he is going somewhere. And it's really quite fun. And we've got to be the kind of people that say, I am going after God. Nothing's going to stop me. Even if other people fall away and are not interested, even if other people think I'm kind of weird for what I'm trying to do, I'm still going. The people that I am gathering need to see I am going somewhere because that's what's attractive to them. And, and something, this kind of going and trying to grow and, and trying to pursue God, we, we do have roadblocks. We have things that have happened in our lives that have made us sick inside or strongholds or things that have just are blockages for us. And we got to do some work. Getting, getting help, getting healing. And that's part of the reason why we do groups at, at Bridgepoint is because when you do life with other people, you start talking through some of these things. Our freedom curriculum is huge for helping us work through things that are kind of dragging us down in our walk. We got to walk with purpose, without baggage. And God can help us with, the, that, with that baggage to get rid of that unwanted. We don't want to do the unwanted behavior, right, that the hurting dog can do. We want to get in a place where we're following the human handler. Okay. I also realized, I think some people in our world that are not followers of Jesus, that are far from God, I think they do a better job of gathering than we do sometimes. Because I think sometimes as believers, we get all worked up in our heads overthinking things. Oh, if I'm going to try to help somebody towards God, I need a theological degree. I need to have an evangelistic speech ready to give. I need to have walked with God for a long time. I, 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 I'm insecure. I'm, I'm introverted. I'm, and believe me, I'm an introvert. But God can do stuff through us if we're willing to let him change us and evolve and help us to grow into being a soul winner, a soul winner. So let's, uh, let's try to let some of those overthinking things fall away and grab onto what's really simple. What's really simple. I think I put in that little phrase, gather and go while we grow. I intentionally put the grow part last just because of the fact that we think, oh, I need to have all this stuff before I can do anything. No, you don't. I mean, God knows that we're like sheep. Things got to be simple for us to be able to follow. So he's, all he's asking us to do is love people well and value them and make effort towards them. So the grow part is last because you know what happens? As we are pursuing people, we pursue God because we need his help. I think that if you're an older person, you know, we can't tell who's mature spiritually or not. The only way we figure that out is when we get to know people. But you could be an older man that is, has had lots of life experiencing, experiences, parenting and marriage and whatever, and you could come alongside of a younger man or a group of younger men, and you could value them and gather them and trust God to show you how to, you should grow while you're investing in them. 
Do you see how it's like a water wheel? We start valuing people. We start, we get neat. We need God to help us. And we, it fill, fuels and it goes round and round. And it's such a great adventure. Such a great, great time. So let's let God work out the messed up theology that's in you and me and in the people that we're gathering. We don't need to get all worked up about that. Take an interest and love others. I think it's a lot more simple than we make it out to be sometimes. God makes us a soul winner when we become a lover of people and when we're willing to be a marshmallow. And the grow part really is connecting so well to our handler, our Jesus. And I, one of the things that I've recently been doing more and more of when I first start out the day is I try to just get my mind thinking about who God is, his character, who, like how big he is. Because we put our God in a box sometimes and think that we're, he's limited to what we're limited to. I have a, a picture of the beach because I want, who loves the beach? Does anybody like the beach? I, oh, I just love the beach. It's just, it's just so big and so beautiful and there's, it's just fascinating to think of the creation of it. And, and I feel small there, but in some really cool way I feel significant. And I think that's how God wants us to, to experience life with him is we see, oh my gosh, he's huge. He's got so much to offer. And we feel small, like we're needy of him, but confident that we have all of his resource with us. Think about the waves. When Have you been at the beach when it's a storming? And the waves are really big and just, I mean, there's a force coming through and it's almost kind of scary. But that force is the passion of how much God loves us. And he comes to avenge us. When we're hurt by somebody, he is hurt and sad. And he comes to protect us. When we need help, i got to figure out how am I going to start school this week. I, I'm nervous. I'm, his power can bring, come in just like the waves and give you what you need to walk through what's tough. And then I think about the ocean when it's calm, when, it, when it's low tide and the water's just coming in so gently. That's our God. He's that gentle with us. He's as soft as the clouds, as hopeful as the rainbow, as forgiving as the sand under our feet when we stand at the shoreline. He's as creative and intentional as the shells that we see and the starfish, the sand dollars that we look and see, wow, he, he created that so intricately. That's how he created each one of us. And guess what? All the sand on the sea, all the sand at the ocean is all the resource that God has and all the love that he has for us. So my encouragement to you is spend some time just marinating in who he is because that gives us the courage to go out and love people well, to, to do whatever might feel uncomfortable to us. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for being so full of care for us. And we know that you love us. Even if we say, nah, not going to do that, not ready for that, you still love us and you still pursue us. Forgive us for the times that we just throw the whole thing in and say, now help us to just take a baby step, Lord. To be open to the wonderful, adventurous life of joining you in loving people really well. We just thank you that you show us what you want us to hear and what you want us to do as a result of your words this morning. And I pray blessings over every one of our families. It's in your name I pray.